Dr. Srileka, we are live. Please go. Okay, sir. A very good afternoon to one and all. Greetings from KCIPM. I, Dr. Srileka, welcome you all to the virtual slide, uh, interactive slide seminar this afternoon that is being hosted by Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. I request all, uh, all you delegates to set your YouTube resolution at 720 pixels for a clear video and participate actively via live chat. I would also like to uh, bring to your notice that uh, the KCIP, uh, the Capcom 2023 uh, will, uh, will be hosted by uh, Father Muller Medical College, Department of Pathology from 5th to 8th October 2023. We will, uh, today, we will be discussing eight cases uh, with few spotters in between uh, and a general reminder to all the participants that presentation time will be four minutes uh, and uh, where you have to discuss the morphological descriptions and differential diagnosis either using PowerPoint uh, and it will be followed by discussion from the faculty from KMC Manipal. All the best uh, participants. The first case will be discussed by Dr. Anusha KM from Kim's Hubli. Good afternoon, Mohan. Am I audible? Go ahead. Myself, Dr. Anusha KM, second year postgraduate from Kings Hubli. Today, I'll be presenting case one from uh, KCIPM virtual interactive slide seminar. The history provided to us was 51 year old female who is a known case of diabetes mellitus presented with the symptoms of uh, fatigue and increased tiredness and was referred and admitted for the evaluation of pancytopenia. On examination, she had paler, there was no ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or organomegaly. Complete hemogram showed ESR of 28 millimeters at the end of one hour. Hemoglobin was 7.3 grams per deciliter and total eicosyte count was 9,800. Platelet count was 24,000. On examining peripheral smear, RBCs were normocytic and normochromic. A uh, few occasional uh, NRBCs, that is nucleated RBCs were also seen. The WBCs were uh, slightly on the upper limit of the normal and there were shift to left also. We can see there were many blast cells which were seen and neutrophils were hyper segmented. Further platelets were reduced and on doing Differential count of 200, 200 cells, we got myeloblasts of 29%, metamyelocytes of 1%, band form of 6%, neutrophils of 60%. With this, we made a provisional diagnosis of acute myeloleukemia. Further, on uh, examining bone marrow aspiration, we can view, we can see the aspirate uh, was hypercellular and we could see few larger cells. On subsequent magnification, and examination of each lineage, it, we saw erythroid series were showing this erythropoiesis, nuclear budding, nucleation, and internuclear bridges which were also seen. Mylar series showed increased number of blasts and cytoplasmic hypogranulation was there. And neutrophils were showing hyper segmentation. And megakaryocytes, uh, they showed a hypo law ovulation and multinucleation. They were also decreased, uh, they were smaller in size. Bone marrow biopsy showed ALI, that is abnormal localization of immature precursor. Yeah. Normally, myelar series will be located in a paratrabacular area. In this case, we can see that all myelar precursors are shifted to a central area, and paratrabacular area is replaced by erythroid series. And differential count for 500 cells was done, and we got a ME ratio of 1 is to 0 0.4. With this, uh, keeping all these things in mind and looking at a morphology seen in aspirate uh, smears, we came to a pro provisional diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia with myelodysplasia related changes, even though it met only two criteria of three, which is mentioned in WHO. 
further we need to do flow cytometry and uh, cytogenetic study to know the subtype of uh, AMA. Thank you. Sushma, ma'am, over to you. The case yeah. will be discussed by Dr. Sushma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aditya. Thank you, Anusha, for the presentation. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So I hope the Slide is visible to all. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so going back to the history, it was a elderly female, a middle-aged female who was basically having features of anemia, that is fatigue and increased tiredness, and she was referred for evaluation of cytopenias. So the parameters provided were HP was low, seven point three grams, whereas total count was normal. I, in fact, it was uh, towards the higher side and platelet count was reduced. Now, briefly, we'll just go through what are the different causes for cytopenias. So, the most common cause for cytopenias is the bone marrow failure, which can be either hypoplastic anemia or aplastic anemia, which can affect all the three cell lines. Or sometimes it may affect only one particular cell line, like pure red cell aplasia, where the patient will only present with anemia. Now, the other causes are bone marrow infiltration, like acute leukemia or lymphoma infiltration, or some other non hematopoietic or non hematological malignancies like carcinomas, or it may be also because of hemophagocytic syndrome or myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, some common causes for pancytopenia are also nutritional anemias like megaloblastic anemia, which is quite common in India, or HIV infections, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndromes. Now, the cytopenias can also be because of peripheral destruction of the cells, like in autoimmune conditions or associated with SLE, or it may be also because of hypersplenism. So, these are the various causes for cytopenias. Now, coming back to our case, what does the peripheral smear findings show? So, Anusha has already described the changes, but I will just highlight on the main points. So we can see RBCs are normocytic, normochromic. The WBCs is predominantly showing a neutrophilic count, and there are occasional NRBCs, which were seen on the smear. So here again showing left shift, which had mainly bands, and you can see the background is hardly show, uh, is showing very occasional platelets. So platelets were significantly reduced in number. Now, what was uh, important was seeing these high NC ratio cells in the smear. So, there were occasional high NC ratio cells showing scant cytoplasm with an immature chromatid and some also showed prominent nucleoli. So, this is another uh, field showing a blast-like cell with a prominent, uh, with two prominent nucleoli. So, this is another cell showing the similar features. So the final import, uh, the major findings on peripheral smear was normocytic, normochromic RBCs, and the WBC was normal in number, showing predominantly neutrophilic count with left shift, and there were occasional blasts. So the blast count which we got on peripheral smear was less than five percent, and there were occasional NRBCs. So it was more like a leukoerythroblastic type of picture. It was not a frank leukemia. Now, when we talk about pancytopenia on the smear or bicytopenia, the marrow can show two types of pictures. The marrow may be either hypocellular or the marrow may be hypercellular. Now, what are the causes for hypocellular marrow? This is mainly the aplastic anemia or the hypoplastic anemia, which can be because of number of causes. It may be either drug, it may be a uh, congenital cause like in smaller age group that is in children but in our patient since it was an adult you have to 
uh, most probably think of the acquired causes like drug induced hypoplastic or aplastic anemia or infection associated like hepatitis or HIV associated or PNH. In PNH also the patient can present with aplastic anemia. You can also have hypoplastic MDS that is hypoplastic myelodysplastic syndrome where there will be features of dysplasia but there will be hypocellularity also in the bone marrow. Now coming to the hypercellular bone marrow. So very often when you have peripheral cytopenias, you may see a cellular marrow uh, in the patient. So what are the causes for hypercellular bone marrow picture? It, it can be seen in acute leukemias where there is suppression of the normal hematopoiesis or infiltration by lymphoma or even myelofibrosis where the bone marrow is replaced by fibrous tissue or myelodysplastic syndrome where there is ineffective hematopoiesis, PNH because of peripheral destructions may show initially hyperplastic marrow or other uh, malignancies like multiple myeloma or hairy cell leukemia. Hemophagocytic syndrome can also show hypercellular marrow because of the intramedullary destruction that can be increased production of cells also. Now, these are the hematological conditions, but you can also have non-hematological conditions where there may, which the patient may present with cytopenias and the marrow will be cellular. And the most common cause which we should remember here is megaloblastic anemia because that is one of the common causes of cytopenias in India. And of course, there are other causes like infections or storage disorders, autoimmune disorders, which can present with uh, cytopenias. Now, coming back to our case, what were the findings on the bone marrow? Was the marrow hypocellular or hypercellular? It was a hypercellular marrow. So, you can see the cellularity is more than 90% in this patient. The cell traits were good. A very cellular marrow, cellular particle as well as cellular cell traits. So you can see all the lineages, there is a quite uh, increase in the myeloid uh, lineage cells with interspersed erythroid lineage cells. So coming to high magnification, you can see there are a lot of myeloid cells with uh, bands, neutrophils, as well as the precursors, and there are erythroid clusters interspersed in between. Now, so when you look at the erythroid lineage, you can see that there is some amount of dyspoiesis which is noted. So, there is binucleated cells, there is nuclear budding. Also, when you look at the myeloid cells, you can see significant dyspoiesis in the myeloid lineage cells. So, there is ring nuclei. You can see here the band is in the form of a ring. There are abnormal lobations in the nucleus of the neutrophils as well as bands. And there are also giant bands. And this was seen in more than 10% of the myeloid cells. So you can see the, uh, the dyspoiesis in myeloid lineage is very, very significant. Now coming to the other fields, again, the dyspoiesis is highlighted in this image. You can see there are a lot of giant bands. There are uh, nuclear lobations in the neutrophils as well as bands. So this is a higher magnification showing the giant bands and highlighting the dyspoiesis. Now, what else do you see in the smear? So it is not only the dyspoiesis, but you also see that there is increase in the blast also. So there were uh, many cells have showing high NC ratio with an immature chromatin and one to two prominent nucleoli. Okay, so this is again a smear showing the abnormal lobations, which is very characteristic in uh, this smear in this image. Okay, so this is a ring nuclei and a giant band. Okay, now coming to megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes were also were appearing normal in number on the smear, and they were also showing some dyspoietic features, like there was nucleocytoplasmic asynchrony. This disintegration of the nuclei. Also, there were hypolobated megakaryocytes, which I could not get the image. Okay, now see in this smear, you can see there are a lot of blast like cells. Some of them look like erythroid cells, which are very round and regular and have a basophilic cytoplasm. Some look like myeloblasts because they have a less amount of cytoplasm and they have prominent nucleoli. 
So here you can see a cluster of blasts showing very dispersed chromatin and some prominent nucleoli. Now coming to iron stores, so you can see the iron stores are increased. It's almost obliterating the uh, marrow particle, almost 5 plus to 6 plus. But the iron was predominantly seen in the macrophages and there were no ring sigroblasts noted in the smear. So what were the important bone marrow aspirate findings? It was a hypercellular marrow with myeloid mildly increased. Now what was very prominent was the dyspoiesis which was noted in all the three cell lines. So erythroid showed dyspoiesis in the form of nuclear budding, binucleation. Myelopoiesis showed significant dyspoiesis in the form of giant binds, abnormal nuclear lobations, and ring nucleus, also megakaryoposis. And the blast count was around 17% of all the nucleated cells, and no ring sideroblasts were seen. Okay, so Anusha, do you want to change your diagnosis at this point? Yes, ma'am. Uh, myelodysplastic syndrome mainly may be a due to nutritional cause. Uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, do you want to subclassify it further? Uh, okay, so nutritional deficiencies could be there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get back to that. Now, coming to the bone marrow biopsy findings, we had uh, again, it showed a cellular marrow with a lot of myeloid cells interspersed by the dyspoietic megakaryocytes. Okay, so as Anusha had already mentioned, there was abnormal localization of the myeloid precursors. So you can see there are a lot of myeloid precursors which are normally seen in the paratropical region, but here it, they were seen in the interstitial region surrounding the fat cells. Also, there was uh, some amount of increase in blast can be noted because there are large cells with immature chromatin. So this is a higher magnification showing the dyspoietic hypolobated megakaryocytes. Here is a micro megakaryocyte. Okay, here also you can see a micro megakaryocyte with very small nucleus and very less amount of cytoplasm. So the main features noted on bone marrow biopsy, again it was a hypercellular marrow with dyspoiesis noted in myelopoiesis. Uh, we can't uh, much appreciate the dyspoiesis in erythroid cells on the biopsy. What is important to see on the biopsy are the megakaryocytes, the number of megakaryocytes as well as the morphology of megakaryocytes. So megakaryocytes were normal in number, but there were dyspoietic forms seen. There were fair number of blasts. Now, ideally, we should do a CD34 or any other stem cell marker to quantify the blast. But in this patient, since the patient went uh, against uh, medical advice, they were discharged against medical advice, so we could not do the further IHC in this patient. So the final diagnosis, yes, excess it is a blast. Sorry, excess blast subcategory. Yeah, so it's a myeloid stem cell neoplasm. If there can be two differential diagnoses, one is myelodysplastic syndrome with excess blast two, since the blast count was more than uh, nine percent. And the second diagnosis, as Anusha had said, it can be AML with myelodysplasia related changes. See, quantifying BLAS is very important to differentiate between these two conditions. And sometimes it may be difficult because the marrow may be diluted or there may be other technical reasons where giving an approximate or an accurate BLAS count may not be easy. So in this, since the marrow was fairly cellular and there were no dilution, so we gave in blast count of 17% of all nucleated cells. So the diagnosis which was favored or which was preferred here was myelodysplastic syndrome with excess blast 2. Now coming to flow cytometry, is flow cytometry indicated in myelodysplastic syndrome? Not, may not be, it may not be a primary indication for diagnosis per se, but sometimes when the morphologically, the dysplasia is not very clearly evident. Flow cytometry can help you because flow cytometry will help you in establishing the abnormal immunophenotype, which is seen in myelodysplastic syndrome. Like in this case, the green population, which is shown in the picture, is the mature granulocytes. The red population is the blast population, and the blue population are the lymphocytes. So you can see normally granulocytes have a lot of granules. So they show a high site scatter. 
But in this case, the granulocytes were all showing a lower site scatter compared to the normal. So normally granulocytes come up to log 150 on the site scatter plot, but in this case, it was just coming up to 100. So it was indicating that there was hypogranularity in the uh, neutrophils. Now coming to the blast population, the blast population was showing positivity for CD13, though CD33 was uh, not expressed. They were also expressing CD34, but they were negative for MPO and they were positive for 117 as well as HLA-DR. So on flow cytometry also, we got around 17% blast, which were expressing CD34, HLA-DR and two myeloid markers, that is CD13 and CD117. Now the myelodysplasia uh, related changes, which we saw in this case, one was the hypogranularity, which was noted in the granulocytes. Also there was, uh, sorry, Also, there was loss of 33, partial loss of 33 in the mature granulocytes. So these are the features of myelodysplasia which were seen or which were observed on the flow cytometry. So on flow cytometry, we got around 17.5% of plus which were positive for myeloid markers, negative for MPO and granulocytes showed a reduced site scatter, partial loss of CD33 and overexpression of CD56. So briefly about myelodysplastic syndrome, this is, these are the criteria, minimal criteria required for diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome. So the prerequisite criteria is cytopenias in one or more lineages, and you should exclude all the other secondary causes for cytopenias, particularly nutritional anemias like megaloblastic anemia or drug-induced cytopenias, infection-associated cytopenias, all these causes should be ruled out before you proceed to a diagnosis of MDS. Now, the more definitive criteria is when you see dysplasia in more than 10% of at least one of the lineage, that is erythroid, myeloid, or megakaryocytic lineage, or if you see 5 to 19% blasts in the bone marrow smears, or if you see typical chromosomal abnormalities which are associated with myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, in our case, uh, chromosomal studies could not be done as the patient was lost for follow-up. So this is the revised 2016 classification of MDS. I'm not uh, going to go into the detail of this, so you all know. So these are the various subcategories which are based on the uh, criteria of the number of uh, ring sideroblasts and the number of blasts in the peripheral blood and the bone marrow. So in this case, we had 17% blasts in the uh, bone marrow, though peripheral blood showed less plus. So it fitted into the cat category of myelodysplastic syndrome with excess plus 2. Now, what are the common cytogenetic abnormalities associated with myelodysplastic syndrome? Uh, deletion 5q, deletion 7q, loss of 17p, or complex karyotypes involving chromosome 5 and 7, deletion 20q, loss of chromosome 13 or deletion 13q. Now, these are the common cytogenetic abnormalities which are associated with MDS. But uh, again, only 50% cases of MDS may be associated with any specific cytogenetic abnormalities. But when they are present, they help in the diagnosis, but when they are absent, uh, it cannot rule out a myelodysplastic syndrome. So the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome is a cumulative diagnosis taking into consideration the clinical presentation of the patient, history related to drugs, uh, infections, or any other systemic disorders, and the peripheral smear findings, the bone marrow findings, as well as cytogenetics if available. So it is a cumulative diagnosis which is derived from multiple uh, parameters. So you cannot definitely diagnose MDS just based on one particular parameter. That's it, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Ragashri from Sims Shimoga. Or you can start, Ragashri. Uh, 
my audible yes you are audible Good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm Dr. Rajeshri from Sims uh, Shumoga. I'll be presenting the case to. Uh, history given was a 36 year old male complaints of uh, fever since 15 days, altered mental status for one day, and pain in bilateral thighs. Sir? Is it audible, sir? Yes, please continue. Good afternoon to all. I'm Dr. Rageshri from Sims Shumoga. I'll be presenting the case to the history given was 36 year old male complaints of fever since 15 days, altered mental status for one day and pain in bilateral thighs since three months. On examination, pallor and moderate splenomegaly was present. Investigations done were CBC had hemoglobin 9.8 gram per deciliter, TLC 2900 uh, cells per cubic millimeter, platelet count 26,000 per cubic millimeter, serum ferritin level was 1131 nanogram per ml, and serum triglyceride levels were 284 milligram per deciliter. So, so based on the history given, it could be chronic inf infection or inflammation involving the CNS and bone marrow showing pancytopenia. Uh, which is reflected by raised serological markers. Coming to the peripheral smear, this is the low power view showing RBCs, which are normocytic hypochromic to microcytic hypochromic. Uh, WBCs appear to be reduced in number. Platelets appear to be reduced in number. Uh, this is the magnified view showing uh, polychromatophil and NRBC. Uh, coming to WBCs, Neutrophils show left shift uh, in the, the band forms and the metamylocyte uh, forms were present. Uh, monocytes appear to be mildly ra uh, raised in number and few reactive lymphocytes were present. So based on the PS finding, my impression would be microcytic hypochromic anemia with leukopenia and thrombocytopenia, pancytopenia for evaluation. Coming to bone marrow aspiration, under low par, uh, the cell fat ap of ratio appears to be normal. Uh, for the age, that is 7 is to 3. The myeloid to erythroid ratio appears to be 1.6 is to 1. The erythropoiesis uh, shows a normoblastic to micronormoblastic uh, type of maturation. Myelopoiesis shows all series of uh, um, se uh, all sequence, all uh, cells uh, in the sequence uh, with the mild increase in blast. Uh, megakaryopoiesis appears to be reduced. Coming to other cells, uh, there is uh, increase in the number of macrophages. Uh, macrophage here, you can see the macrophages uh, engulfing the late normoblast. Uh, and here we can see the macrophage engulfing uh, lymphocyte. Uh, this is on the higher magnification uh, showing hemophagocytosis. Here we can see uh, histiocytic aggregates. And on the high power wave, we can see uh, histiocytic aggregates uh, uh, looking like epithelioid cells. Uh, this is the differential count uh, showing uh, 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 um, ME ratio 1 is to 1.6 is to 1, uh, which is already discussed. So based on the bone marrow aspiration, uh, my impression would be hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis with epithelioid histiocytic lesion. Coming to bone marrow biopsy, the length of the biopsy was adequate. Uh, the cellularity is normal, that is 70% cellular and the topography appears to be normal. Here we can see uh, aggregate of uh, histiocytes, uh, which have uh, at, at focus uh, showing uh, elongated and slipper shaped nuclei, nuclei uh, which morphologically appear like epithelioid uh, histiocytes uh, forming uh, uh, vague granulomas. This is again a different foci showing multinucleated giant cell engulfing a neutrophil surrounded by epithelioid histiocytes. 
this is a horseshoe shaped giant cell this is another focus of granuloma showing giant cell surrounded by epithelioid uh, histiocytes uh, like in the bone marrow aspiration uh, in the biopsy also we can see macrophage engulfing the erythroid precursor that is late normoblasts uh, also macrophages uh, engulfing the mature rbcs can be seen uh, the bony trabeculae uh, uh, destruction is seen uh, at few foci so based on this uh, finding my impression would be granulomatous lesion uh, most probably tuberculosis with secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis uh, my dd would be other uh, granulomatous diseases thank you thank you dr agarshree dr suma uh, you can take over Okay, th thank you, Ragashree. So, just uh, highlighting the important points on the history. So, it was an adult male who presented basically with features of infection that was fever and altered mental, uh, mental status. So, on examination, the important findings was patient had pallor and he had uh, significant splenomegaly. And on laboratory investigations, the predominant feature was pancytopenia. All the three cell lines were decreased. Now, again, uh, we have already discussed the causes of pancytopenia. So, uh, it, you have to first consider the common causes like uh, nutritional deficiencies or infections or uh, the more common causes. So, in this patient, coming to the peripheral smear findings, the RBCs were normocytic, normochromic. In the background, you can see very occasional platelets. So the platelet count was significantly reduced. Uh, the neutroph uh, the differential count predominantly showed neutrophils with mild left shift. So there were no other significant findings on the peripheral smear. RBCs were normocytic, normochromic. WBCs and platelets were reduced in number. It was a neutrophilic count, and there were no abnormal cells seen in the smear. Now, coming to the bone marrow aspirate findings. So, we have seen in the previous case that when you, uh, when we see pancytopenia, the marrow can be either a hypocellular marrow or it can be a hypercellular marrow. Now, in this case, what we are seeing is a hypercellular marrow, which is showing predominantly Okay, so you can see it's a hypercellular marrow showing around 90% cellularity. Cell trails are mildly diluted, but you can see all the three cell lines. There are erythroid cells, there are myeloid cells in the cell trails. Now, the erythroid cells more or less appeared normal. There was mild increase in the basophilic normoblast. Very subtle dyspoiesis was also noted. These are the myeloid cells showing normal maturation. So myeloid precursors band again of uh, some amount of dysposis was also noted in the myeloid series. So you can see the erythroid cluster here showing some dysposis. Now, since the patient had fever, this dysposis may be associated with infection. Okay, so these are the myeloid cells showing normal maturation with mild dysposis. Uh, Megakaryocytic was more or less normal. It was appearing reduced in number because of the dilutional uh, factor. Now, this is a megakaryocyte showing empiripolysis of the neutrophil in the cytoplasm. So, the important find, okay, now what was important in the bone marrow aspirate was there were increased number of histocytes. So, you can see a uh, macrophage here showing abundant foamy cytoplasm. Now here the cytoplasm is empty. So this is an activated uh, macrophage which was seen in the peripheral smear. Now as you screen through the slide, you get a whole lot number of macrophages and this is not an empty macrophage. So you can see there are a lot of cells in the cytoplasm. So here it's mainly predominantly showing the erythroid cells and the 
lymphoid cells. Another macrophage showing some platelets and lymphocyte and RBCs, mature RBCs. This is again showing mature RBCs and some erythroid precursors also. Another one showing uh, erythroid precursors. So what was predominant feature in the bone marrow was hemophagocytosis. So there was significantly increased number of macrophages which were showing significant hemophagocytosis. Okay, another one showing RBCs and lymphocytes and erythroid precursors as well as some platelets also. So the important findings on bone marrow aspirate was it was a hypercellular marrow showing uh, mildly increased erythropoiesis with some amount of dyspoiesis. Myelopoiesis was showing normal maturation with mild dyspoiesis. Megakaryocytes were more or less normal in number. No abnormal cells were noted. But the important finding was macrophages were increased in number and they were showing significant hemophagocytosis. So as Dr. Ragashree has rightly diagnosed it as a hemophagocytic syndrome. But before we call it a hemophagocytic syndrome, we need to fulfill the criteria for the syndrome. So coming to causes for hemophagocytic syndrome. Now, if it is seen in the child, you have to look up or you have to work up the child for primary or familial hemophagocytic syndrome, which are associated with the various genetic mutations. But in an adult, the secondary hemophagocytic syndrome are more common, which are commonly associated with viral infections like ABV, CME or HIV or herpes simplex. And now the latest addition, of course, is the novel coronavirus. It can also be associated with malignancies like leukemia and lymphoma or autoimmune conditions where it is called as macrophage activation syndrome. And it is more severe in these conditions and it can often be even fatal. So more commonly associated with SLE or systemic sclerosis, even rheumatoid arthritis, it can be also commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, there are certain other infections which may be rarely associated with hemophagocytic syndrome like tuberculosis, malaria, enteric fever and leishmaniasis. Now, coming back to the patient, what were the bone marrow biopsy findings? So the biopsy was cellular showing uh, you can see these dark erythroid clusters. It was showing scattered megakaryocytes and the myeloid cells interspersed in between. Now, what else was present? You can see there is a, a foamy area, clustered cells you can see here, which is less cellular as compared to the other. So, two more such areas noted in the marrow space. So when you go to a higher magnification, you can see that it is a cluster of histocytes. So histocytes showing abundant foamy cytoplasm are seen in these clusters. So another wave shows nice Langhen giant cells. So these are the classical Langhen giant cells which are associated with tuberculosis. So you can see there is well-formed granuloma comprising of epithelioid histocytes and Langhan giant cells. So this is a magnified view showing the classical slipper-shaped nuclei which you see in the epithelioid cells of mycobacterium tuberculosis. AFP was done in this patient but it was negative. So the important findings on bone marrow biopsy was hypercellular marrow with normal uh, hematopoietic lineages seen but there were multiple paratrabecular and interstitial medium-sized confluent granulomas which were com 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 composed of epithelioid cells and Langengine cells. No necrosis was noted in this case and AFP was negative. Now this bone marrow biopsy was sent for PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis by gene expert method and it was positive. So the final diagnosis was Hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis associated with mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is the criteria. So as I told you, just by seeing hemophagocytosis on the bone marrow, you cannot diagnose the case as hemophagocytic syndrome. So we need to uh, fulfill this criteria, the clinical criteria. So the first uh, HLH criteria were uh, published in 2004. Uh, which included fever, splenomegaly, cytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia, hyperferritinemia, as well as hemophagocytosis. So there were eight criteria and five, at least five out of the eight criteria should be fulfilled for diagnosis. But since it was difficult to 
get these lab reports early because uh, 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 bone marrow biopsy would take time, even lab, other par lab parameters would take time. So for a faster diagnosis and for a more sensitive uh, diagnosing criteria, these criteria was modified in 2009. So now uh, we should have at least three of the following, that is fever, splenomegaly, cytopenias, and hepatitis. And at least one of the following, that is hyperferritinemia or hemophagocytosis seen on biopsy or elevated soluble CD25 and lower absent NK cell activity. Whereas the other criteria are not given much importance. Now in our case, fever was there, splenomegaly was there, cytopenias were there. So already three uh, criteria were fulfilled in the first uh, group and in the second group, hemophagocytosis was present. So this also one criteria was fulfilled, hyperferritinemia was also present. So the diagnosis of hemophagocytic syndrome was confirmed. So these are the common causes which I have already discussed. So tuberculosis is not often associated with hemophagocytic syndrome, but rarely the patient can present with hemophagocytic syndrome depending on the immune system of the patient. So this was, I think it was a straightforward case and most of the students have diagnosed it correctly. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Sujitra from MS Ramaya uh, College, Bureau. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. You're audible. You can start. Uh, I'm Dr. Sujitra. I'm a postgraduate from MS Ramaya Medical College. Uh, I'll be presenting case number three. So the given history was 15-year-old male with left orbitofrontal region mass. A radiology was suggestive of a meningioma. I will be presenting the histological features with the pictures taken from the slide. So this picture under 20th shows a neoplasm comprising of ossicles which are surrounded by uh, benign spindle cell stoma and the ossicles are haphazardly arranged and they are numerous in number which are composed of open bone and um, with central basophilic uh, deposition which are resembling somatoid bodies and occasional lacrimal osteocytes. And uh, uh, in one, one fragment showed a benign spindle cells, which was arranged predominantly in the sheets and some in whirling pattern. And coming to the morphology of the individual cells, the individual cells was a uh, spindle shape, a void to elongated plump benign spindle cells with indistinct cell membranes embedded in the fibrous stroma and it had a moderate eosinophilic cytoplasm and the mitotic activity was minimal. And these pictures uh, shows occasional multinucleated uh, uh, giant cells. These are multinucleated giant cells which are seen. And uh, these pictures shows focal areas of osteoblastic rimming. So here we can see open bone which is surrounded by the which are rimmed by the osteoblast. And there was no evidence of necrosis in the section study. Uh, so, based on the given clinical details and radiological findings and above histological features, I would like to consider the following differential diagnosis. Uh, first is introsteus meningioma, uh, WHO grade 1, and the second one is ossifying fibroma, possibly juvenile somatoid type. So, some of the points regarding introsteus meningioma and ossifying fibroma. So, introsteus meningioma, it has bimodal peak incidence, one at uh, 20 decades and other at 60. And it has slight female predominance and site most common in frontotemporal and orbital regions. And histological feature will be it will have abandoned thickened reactive open and lamella bone, which are separated by dense collagenous fibrous tissue containing plum spindle or ovoid vesicular nuclei. And uh, the IHS which can be used are EMA, uh, somatostatin receptor 2A, progesterone receptor. 
and uh, regarding ossifying fibroma juvenile somatoid type uh, the age varies from 16 to 33 years with a slight male predominance and more common in periorbital frontal and ethmoid bones and uh, it will have small uniform ossicles which are somatoid bodies embedded in cellular stroma composed of spindle and stellate cells so some of these features like age and uh, um, the site and the histological feature correlates with our case so with the additional clinical radiological and ISPs uh, will help us to conclude the diagnosis uh, thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Suchitra. Uh, now, uh, the case will be discussed by Dr. Vishwapriya Ma'am from KMC. Uh, hope my, I am, uh, I am, uh, I am, uh, I am uh, Dr. Vishwapriya here from uh, KMC Manipal. Uh, so, I will be discussing the case here. So, as our PG has rightly pointed out, she has, uh, we had, she has narrowed down to the differentials very clearly. So this was our initial. The this was our initial DD also. So we can see that we are dealing with a fibrooseous lesion here. You can see I have highlighted the two components here. Uh, one is the one is the marked red is the is the is the uh, uh, fibrous component which is the stromal component which is composed of bland spindle cells and then the yellow star marks the the osseous comp component or the metaplastic component or, or the so we are dealing with benign fibro osseous lesion so uh, the the so we see that this is a biphasic tumor composed of uh, half hazard proliferation of spindle cells along with uh, um, somometoid or ossifying because I, I use the word somometoid because i can see uh, some 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 still basophilic calcification here along with the or the pink osteoid deposition so the the diagnosis here was given out as has been rightly pointed out by our uh, 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 colleague here that it, it it is a juvenile ossifying fibroma the variant is a juvenile uh, somometoid ossifying fibroma so these are this is a variant of ossifying fibroma they, they are aggressive variants called as juvenile ossifying fibroma again this has two variants one is the somometoid variant the somometoid ossifying fibroma and the other is a trabecular variant so we can see more better osseous area. So we see that this is a biphasic tumor. So uh, composed of fibrous spindle lesion and uh, bone. So this is, was given out as somometoid ossifying fibroma. It's a benign fibro. So this was a fib benign fibro osseous neoplasm of the craniofacial skeleton, mostly involves the paranasal sinuses and the orbit. Seen most commonly in the ethmoid and the frontal sinuses. Radiographically, it's seen it is it is a well-defined mass with various of opacification, and they are initially radiolucent, but as as they age, the the calcification and the ossification gives a, 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 a more of a radio opacification. So we see that they are ill-defined unencapsulated tumor, mostly involving the uh, most commonly involving the mandible, but also uh, if they they are they can involve the maxilla, the ethmoid sinus, the paranasal sinuses, etc. Um, they are supposed to originate from the dentigerous epithelium. So they are a bi biphasic tumors composed of hypocellular, uh, small uniform stellate to spindle cells. They are fibroblast like with scan collagen deposition. Then you have uh, multiple collagen ossicles and immature osteoid, which which eventually mature out into uh, these uniform ossicles are called somometoid bodies. They are not somoma; they are somometoid means somoma-like bodies. Uh, but they are as they are uh, they are larger and they like the the lamellar pattern, or we call it the Lysgang rings, which which they lack. So commonly we we see cystic degeneration and secondary ABC like changes can be seen here. And they are they tend to be locally aggressive with uh, with 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 uh, recurrence rates of 30 to 56 percent. Immunohistochemistry there is no diagnostic immunohistochemistry, but we we can do RN, RUNX2, RUNX2, and SADB2. They are osteogenic markers. They tend to express RUNX2 and SADB2. They are because they are bone forming tumors. There is no specific molecular alteration has been identified in them per se. Uh, the the treatment is mostly curettage and in recurrent cases a uh, local resection. 
So our DDs are fibrous dysplasia, ossifying fibroma. This is the ossifying fibroma, somatoid variant, and intraosseous meningioma. As has been discussed by our colleague here, the commonest differential, the closest differential diagnosis, an intraosseous meningioma or metaplastic meningioma. See, uh, we uh, see that these ossifying uh, somatoid ossifying fibromas are mostly seen in young people, mostly involving the extragnathic craniofacial bones. Uh, the 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 periorbital, the sinuses, paranasal sinuses, etc. They are characterized by rapid growth and local recurrence. Uh, but uh, we we don't see much of an osteoblastic activity or osteoblastic rimming in uh, ossifying fibroma rather than in an intraosseous meningioma. And why immunohistochemistry has been also been discussed by our colleague here. Uh, intraosseous meningiomas tend to be EMA positive, somatostatin receptor 2A positive, vimentin positive, CD99 positive, but these tend to be EMA negative to weak. They are positive for all bone forming markers. You can have osteocalcin, you can do SAT B2, you can have RANX2. So this was a rare case. This is, a, this is an uncommon case, an uncommon tumor, ossifying fibroma. It tend to be, tend to be commonly seen in, in, in long bones, etc. But in the craniofacial, that to a variant of juvenile uh, somometoid ossifying fibroma, the, the juvenile variant tends to be rare. So this case has been presented because of its rarity and its diagnostic uh, challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the, uh, for the presentation. Uh, next will be uh, Spotters by Dr. Bridge Mohan. Uh, viewers, please note that you can give your reply in the YouTube uh, channel uh, comment section. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Still like I uh, Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Vishwapriya, can you please... Uh, yes, sure. uh, I'll stop sharing my screen just a yeah. minute. Yes. Hello, all PGs. Um, I'll be uh, showing you a few slides uh, with the case with the characteristic finding of that particular entity. And uh, I would like to remind you here that this is completely PG oriented uh, slides. So I request all PGs who have logged in to respond um, the case uh, on the live chat on YouTube. So Please uh, respond. Okay. Uh, Sulekha, ma'am, can you confirm my slides are visible? Yes, sir. Your uh, slide is visible, sir. Your PPT is visible. Okay, just give me a moment. Viewers, please note that you'll be given 30 to 45 seconds to uh, answer the questions. All right, this is the first case. Please respond, all the PGs who are uh, who are there in the live chat. Please respond. Thank you. I'm getting the responses now. Okay, till now almost uh, more than 95% uh, they are correct uh, about the diagnosis. 
I will just uh, display the diagnosis and move on to the next case. This is uh, medullary carcinoma of thyroid. So I will not discuss uh, these cases. These are just the spotters. So let's go on uh, to the next case. Okay, please see the image and the history and respond accordingly. Make sure that you give the diagnosis and the mutation along with it. Okay, along with the diagnosis, I want the most frequent mutation also, not just the diagnosis or just the mutation. Please write um, in the live chat both the diagnosis as well as frequent mutation studied here. Excellent, excellent responses. Wonderful. Okay, I almost uh, have seen the responses and uh, they're very well um, written and with along with the diagnosis and mutations, both are almost correct. So this is papillary carcinoma thyroid uh, with BRAF V600 mutation, most frequently seen in papillary carcinoma thyroid. Silakam, so, do I have time? Uh, can I saw the uh, another one more uh, spotters and uh, the next yes, in the, meantime, the next person can get ready with the presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can show one more spotter, sir. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, I will go ahead and uh, show you um, one more spotter. Diagnosis also, not just malignant or benign. Please write the diagnosis as well. Yes, I've started getting the responses and uh, nicely, I mean, uh, all the responses, whatever I'm getting is correct. Thank you, Padma, ma'am. Okay. Okay, I'll stop here. I'll stop here. And uh, this is correct adenomatoid tumor. It's a benign lesion. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll uh, come in between like a pickle. 
um, to make the main dishes more tasteful between the presentation. Thank you, Sulekha, ma'am. Over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the cases. Uh, next presenter is Dr. Pooja from KSA Medical Academy, Mangalore. Pooja, you can start. Yeah, we can see your slide. You can start. We can't hear you, Pooja. The voice is a little uh, breaking a little. You can start sharing your screen. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we can hear you now. Good afternoon, uh, respected teachers and uh, colleague, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I am Dr. Pooja Vijay, second year postgraduate from uh, Mangalore. So I am presenting today case number four. Uh, it is an 18-year-old male with uh, uh, right submalar gland swelling, grossly measuring 4.5 into 0.5 centimeter. It is a radiology was suggestive of lymphoma. Going to the morphology. Uh, morphologically, this is the uh, low power view of the given slide. Uh, you can, the black arrows, uh, the uh, black arrows I have marked uh, is the normal cell gland tissue which uh, on further magnification it, it is found to be a cell gland tissue has both uh, mucinous as well as serous glands. Uh, so this is another focus where you can uh, see the uh, asinar destruction. There is marked fibrosis with uh, lobular configuration as well as the red uh, arrow marks the uh, finding that is periductal fibrosis. So on further magnification, we can see that uh, the periductal fibrosis, it is uh, infiltrated by lymphocyte. There is dense uh, lymphocyte infiltration. Uh, so this is another field where you can see in the periphery, there is normal salivary gland tissue center. There is vein asinar atrophy along with uh, lymphoid along with uh, lymphoid infiltration. Uh, this is another uh, uh, focus where you can see uh, the lympho lymphoid aggregation. Uh, the, there is uh, dense lymphoid aggregates along with uh, reactive uh, epithelial cells, which is found within the aggregate. And on magnification, we can see that uh, the lymphoid aggregates, they comprise of uh, mature lymphocytes as well as the plasma cells. The plasma cells are marked with the black arrows. Uh, so again, another uh, high power view of the uh, lymphoplasma cytic infiltration and uh, within this infiltrate we can see the uh, reactive acinar epithelial cells so this is another field where you can see sclerosis uh, so the dds coming to the dds the main uh, differential is first one is uh, chronic uh, sclerosing sialadenitis of the submandibular salivary gland uh, that is also known as the kutner tumor so the features which was found uh, uh, which supported the diagnosis of Kutner is the involvement of the submandibular gland, partial preservation of the architecture, periductal fibrosis and lymphocyte infiltration. Uh, then there was marked fibrosis and sclerosis. Then there was a varying asinar atrophy and a moderate to marked inflammatory infiltrate, uh, which comprised of lymphocytes and plasma cells. And uh, one feature which was not supporting was the age group. Uh, Kutner's is most commonly found in the adult age group. Um, second uh, differential was the uh, benign lymphopathelial sialadenitis, also known as a Michelix disease. Uh, also, another terminology that is lymphopathelial sialadenitis, LESA, which is associated with Jogren's and HIV infection. Uh, so, the uh, features which con uh, supported the diagnosis of LESA is again extensive lymphocyte infiltration, lymphoepithelial islands, whereas uh, one uh, Against LESA, LESA is more common in parotid gland uh, with uh, the mild, the asana restriction is milder compared to that of Kutner. Uh, then there will be focal epimyopithelial islets in LESA. Also, hypoplastic multiple geminal center formation will be seen, which is not uh, found in this slide. And also, plasma cells are not seen. So, uh, comparing uh, these two, the most uh, supporting uh, diagnosis is Kutner's tumor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pooja. The case will be discussed by Dr. Vishwapriya. Uh, 
uh, hope my uh, slides are visible and i'm audible i guess so we see that uh, we we uh, the description has been good but we can uh, we see that there are diffuse aggregates of abnormal histiocytes here with which is a prominent eosinophilic infiltrate around the histiocytic aggregates uh, so we see that these these histiocytes if we can zoom in we see that they have nuclear grooves or nuclear folds or longitudinal intranuclear grooves so uh, our our uh, so a common exam question is to enumerate tumors with uh, nuclear grooves so the most common example which we all remember is papillary thyroid carcinoma then we also have pap papillary carcinoma of the papillary rcc also then you have danular sar cell tumors brenner's tumor spen urothelial carcinomas lch they all are tumors with prominent nuclear groups this is again an important exam question which i have seen is 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 inquired upon in most of our uh, postgraduate exams so we see that there is a there is an this is an infiltration by abnormal histiocytes with nuclear groups along with a uh, uh, eosinophilic infiltrate and a prominent uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate so we good we got some ihcs immunohistochemistry done we, we have a cd68 we see that those aggregates are pro, pro, positive for we see that cd68 cd68 is a cytoplasmic stain s100 protein s100 is a nuclear plus cytoplasmic stain we see that they are positive for s100 and the low ki67 so we see that they are hist aggregates of histiocytes we don't have cd1a uh, or langerin that is cd207 uh, and bra v600e so the, the the diagnosis was given out as langerhans cell histiocytosis it was first described by paul langerhans in 1868 so what is lch lch is not langhans type of giant cells they are different this is langerhans cells langerhans cells are those cells are specialized histiocytes uh, which which with the with the typical immunophenotype and morphology so there it is also called as hans kuller christian disease so we have something called as unifocal or then we call it if we have a uni system or a single system or a unifocal disease we call it as eosinophilic granuloma because we have these epithelioid cells lcs langerhans cells and eosinophils which are forming aggregates we used to call them eosinophilic granuloma we, we do not use the term eosinophilic granuloma now then if it's a multifocal multicentric or multi system disease we call it as a hans kuller christian disease or letter cv disease also is also was termed as histiocytosis x because we didn't know what the genetic mutation was so lch is a clonal proliferation of langerhans cells they are modified histiocytes with a typical genetic alteration that is braf v600e in the braf protein exon 15 there is an alteration which changes valine is replaced by glutamine thus causing constitutive activation of the map kinase pathway so we have now uh, as we move on we have something called as braf omas braf omas are those it's an umbrella term of all tumors which have a braf v600e mutation so langerhans cell histiocytosis most commonly involves the lymph nodes the head and neck sites we can have well, although it can have we can have disseminated disease it can involve the bone marrow it can involve the visceral organs the liver spleen kidneys etc um so so that's uh, so so we so the most important for us is to demonstrate the presence of uh, uh, of the uh, cd1a immunohistochemistry or langerin that is cd207 immunohistochemistry along with braf e600 mutation that is diagnostic of langerhans cell histiocytosis so how do we describe an lch cell it's an elongated enlarged nuclei with a vesicular chromatin vesicular means a vesicle means a, a water filled uh, cyst like the vesicles we get on the skin that means it will be more clear a small inconspicuous nucleoli a basophilic small inconspicuous basophilic nucleoli and it has a typical reniform nuclei with a membrane indentation or a groove and it has a inflammatory cell infiltrate primarily eosinophils but it may also include lymphocytes plasma cells and neutrophils we may have lch which do not have eosinophils at all but we are seeing a prominent plasma lymph lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate also so the immune coming to the immunohistochemistry they are uh, histiocytes they will be cd68 and cd163 positive they are positive for s100 protein cd1a and langerin the most diagnostic ihc for 
Langerhans cells is CD1A and Langerin, and the typical or the defining mutation is BRAF E600E. We do have a IHC for BRAF E600E mutant protein. Why is this important? This is important because now we have targeted therapy for uh, BRAF E600E, that is Dabrafenib and Vemurafenib. So demonstrating these mutations is important. And again, an important exam, exam question would be uh, the, to enumerate the various other tumors which show BRAF E600E mutation. Among the histiocytosis, we have LCS, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and Ardine Chester disease. Again, that's also a histocyte, uh, neoplastic lesion of histiocytes, which have uh, BRAF E600E mutation. Then again, as Dr. Bridge was discussing here, we have papillary thyroid carcinoma, anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Then you have CNS tumors, you have epithelioid glioblastoma, ganglioglioma, pilocytic astrocytomas. Uh, papillary craniopharyngiomas, you have carcinoma colon, carcinoma adenocarcinoma lung, which uh, then you have especially the sericyl uh, the pathway adenomas and carcinomas, they tend to have BRAF E600 mutation. So again, BRAFomas, it can be, the, we can have, we have the concept of what is called as umbrella trials now, where, where the tumors are classified not according to the histology, but based on their uh, on their underlying genetic mutation. So BRAFOMAS, we could read up about BRAFOMAS. Ultrastructurally, Langerhans cell contain what is known as Burbeck granules. They have something called the tennis, tennis racket appearance. So this I know was uh, uh, our closest differential included a cutnal tumor here as our colleague rightly pointed out, but we were able to demonstrate the presence of Langer aggregates of Langerhans cells along with the presence of uh, prominent histiocytes and the BRAF E600 mutation. The diagnosis was given out as a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. This case has been discussed uh, because of its uh, rarity and its diagnostic challenge here. And uh, mostly Langerhans cell histiocytosis is expected in children less than five years of age, but and typically involving the lymph nodes or the bone or, or, or the craniofacial bones or the lymph nodes, but this was a a uh, rarer entity occurring in an elderly, in a more, uh, what do I say, at an advanced age, not an elderly, but an advanced age, but still a kid at an uncommon site. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Ishita from Vaidehi Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Bengaluru. Dr. Ishita, you can start. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible. You can start. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, all. I'm Dr. Ishita Om Prakash Gupta, second year postgraduate from Vedehi Institute of Medical Science and Research Center, Bangalore. I'll be presenting case five today. So the history that was given was a 15 years old male that presented with pain over right thigh since years. On MRI, it was a circumscribed lesion, which was an eccentric lytic lesion involving the greater trochanter of the right femur. T1 was iso-intense, T2 heterogeneous, hyper-intense, and a query of benign neoplastic process was given. So studying the h &E stain sections of the lesion, the lesion showed a zonal architecture showing the lobules of chondromyxoid tissue with intervening spindle fibers. The lobules, they demonstrated a hypocellular center with a hypocellular periphery and intervening spindle cells. The, uh, these lobules on higher magnification, they also showed spindle and stellate cells, which were in the chondromyxoid background. These individual cells, they had oval to spindle nuclei with indistinct eosinophilic cytoplasm, and they showed bipolar to multipolar cytoplasmic extensions. Some areas, they also showed cells with enlarged pleomorphic nuclei. The center of the lobules is showed features that were similar to hyaline cartilage. Also, there were noted osteoclast-like giant cells at the periphery of the lobules that was admixed with the spindle cells. And also few areas, this uh, showed hemocytin deposits and also a foci of newborn formation with mineralization was noted. So taking into consideration, no evidence of necrosis or typical mitosis, cystic change or degenerative change was noted in the slide studied. So taking into consideration the histopathological features, a differential diagnosis that we considered was chondromyxoid fibroma, chondrosarcoma, chondroblastoma, and giant cell tumor. 
and a probable diagnosis of chondromyxoid fibroma was given. The points favoring our diagnosis was the age and the sex of the individual. Since chondromyxoid fibromas, they are more common in second to third decade and more common in males. And then histopathologically, they show a zonal architecture, which has lobules that are of chondromyxoid uh, stroma. And in those stroma, there are stele cells and uh, spindle cells and giant cells are noted in the periphery of the lobules. And an important feature for establishing the diagnosis is the clinical radiological correlation in which uh, in a patient with chondromyxoid uh, fibroma, the patient it uh, presents with a long history of pain and on radiologically, it is a well circumscribed eccentric lytic lesion, usually involving the long bones, mainly the femur and the tibia, which was similar to the case provided. So we gave a diagnosis of chondromyxoid fibroma. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishita. The case will be discussed by Dr. Vishwapriya. Sorry, the case will be discussed by Dr. Vidya, ma'am. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope my uh, slides are visible. Ma yes, ma'am, your slides are visible, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm Dr. Vidya, and I will be discussing uh, cases five and six. So let's start with case five. Like I said, uh, just to highlight the important uh, history that was given, it was a young child and uh, the uh, pain with pain in the thigh region uh, since two years, there was no history of trauma. And on local examination, there was no swelling, deformity or local rise of temperature. It was only because of the pain and the subsequent radiological uh, examination that this was detected. MRI showed uh, uh, circumscribed, well circumscribed eccentric lytic lesion, and it also had peripheral foci uh, of hyperintensity, suggestive, uh, which is called as blooming, suggestive of a benign neoplastic process. Curettage was done. Now, before going on to the uh, tumor proper, I would like to say that how do you approach a bone tumor? You know, uh, you have seen, your, uh, I will show you the radiology pictures. You know, the patient has is a young child, has pain. So how do you approach? So the most important or in that order, I would say, is first you have to look into the age. So there are certain tumors that occur in very young children. There are certain tumors which occur in an elderly uh, age group. So based on your age, you, you will get some idea to the diagnosis. Also, the site of uh, involvement radiology i would i would say you know, bone tumors are never diagnosed without radiology so just seeing your histopath slides is not enough you have to correlate it with radiology and of course lastly the morphology oh uh, at, at the same time you know that let's let's say long bones are divided into three uh, zones you have the epiphysis metaphysis and the diaphysis now there are tumors that specifically arise in particular sites like you have only three tumors that are classically described to occur in the epiphysis. You have one is the giant cell tumor, one is clear cell chondrosarcoma, and the other one is chondroplastoma. Metaphysis, you have a big list of tumors, including chondromyxoid fibroma, uh, I mean, aneurysmal bones, of course, and chondrosarcoma, the diaphysial tumors, where in the pediatric age group, you get this evening sarcoma. In the elderly age group, you get lymphomas, and so also the other tumors. So it is all, whenever you look into your into the radiology picture, just try to localize. Is it an epiphysial lesion? Is it lytic? Is it circums circumscribed? Is it infiltrating the cortex? Is there, is there any soft tissue uh, extension? So all that is very important. Yeah, so this was the MRI images of the this thing. As you can see here, so is do you think this is epiphysial or metaphysial or diaphysis? So this does look like this looks like epiphysial lesion. And I mean sorry, metaphysial lesion. Now look at it closely. It is very well circumscribed, okay, very well defined, somewhat eccentric. 
eccentrically located. And this is the T1 image, and this is the T2 image, which is showing some heterogeneous hyperintensity. Also, this the blooming that I already mentioned. So the blooming suggests that it is more of a benign process. Yeah, now let's, let us look at the proper uh, histopathology. Now, this is the scanner view. And like uh, Ishita rightly pointed out, what do you see? You're seeing nice lobulated appearance. You're seeing a lobulated appearance of the tumor. There are some areas which appear dark blue. Let's see what they are, they are comprised of. Yeah, at this uh, uh, power, you can appreciate that these lobules, they look more hypocellular towards the center, while they are being more hypercellular towards the periphery. Yes, and now these, uh, these are the, the more dark blue or indigo colored appearance of this thing. This is nothing but chondroid areas, okay? These are chondroid areas. They, mean, they are almost mature, almost mature. So in this tumor, you can see uh, chondrogenic areas of different ages of maturation. So this is almost mature uh, chondrogenic areas. And as, as I said, these lobules are rimmed or surrounded by the spindle cell proliferation. And you, uh, if you see closely, you can also see some giant cells, osteoclastic giant cells here and there. This is the higher power view. This, as you can see, you can nicely appreciate it is chondrogenic in nature. You can see this chondrocytes surrounded by lacunae and this chondroid matrix. Okay, there are some binucleate cells here as well. This is the still higher power image of the same. There were other areas. So you, you appreciated the spindle cell proliferation. You appreci appreciated the chondroid component. Now let us see there are certain other elements as well. These are slightly sky blue uh, areas or mixoid areas, I would rather call it. And what are these cells? Show? What are the cellular components here? Yeah, this is the higher power view, which is showing this nice spindle cells. They are bland. Okay, they are bland. And then you're seeing all these stellate cells. Basically, even in the previous images also, you were not finding any mitosis. Actually, uh, there were some six to seven slides or uh, of, this, of this case, or I think more of it, but none of them showed striking or significant pleomorphism, nor did they show mitosis. Of course, no necrosis. Why, why is it important to, uh, to remind ourselves of these three end points? They are they will favor a malignant diagnosis. So there was not much of mitosis, not much of pleomorphism, focal areas of pleomorphism, like Dr. Ishita pointed out, it was that, but it was not uh, correlating with the mitotic count. So the mitosis was very, very rare. This is another area I wanted to show you the third component here. You are finding this spindle cell proliferation. This is the mixoid areas. Yeah, and this is the higher power of the scene showing this nice spindle cells, short spindle cells, I would say, bland looking, no mitosis, no pleomorphism. This was not there in the slides that I gave you all, but this was uh, peripherally on the periphery of the lesion also showed these proliferation of these uh, osteoclastic or aggregates of the feature of this tumor. Another image because uh, you know, but histopathology is all all images. You should have the habit of linking images or morphology to the tumor. So this is this uh, mixoid areas again with those bland spindle and stellate cells, and then this is the area which had more of the spindle cell proliferation. So with this, um, I would like to summarize here. It was a young child with the on the radiology. It was a metaphyseal lesion looked benign on radiology and on microscopy you, you saw these components you had the chondroid areas you had the mixoid areas you had the spindle cell areas mitosis necrosis pleomorphism was not striking there was also few islands or focal uh, areas with uh, osteoclastic giant cells so based on this i think um, ishita also has uh, reached the same diagnosis so it is a classic case of chondromyxoid fibroma uh, the patient received curative touch and uh, followed by bone grafting and DHS and DSP. Uh, they say curative touch is not the best way. Uh, they say an end block resection is the way to uh, for a complete cure because these tumors are can recur. However, the patient has been doing well two years and un uneventful with no recurrence. So let's learn a few 
more points about this tumor that is chondromyxoid fibroma. So it, it falls under the cartilaginous tumors. So it's a benign cartilaginous tumor. They are very rare. Uh, they just account for 0.5% of all bone tumors and 2% of benign bone tumors. You should always remember the first person who described the, any tumor. You know, they were the first persons like Jaffe and Lichtenstein was the first per, were the first people to separate chondromyxoid fibroma from chondrosarcoma. So earlier, since it had this cartilaginous uh, uh, components, you know, they were being called as chondrosarcoma. So it was Jaffe and Lichtenstein who first, you know, separated them out from chondrosarcomas way back in 1943. Like I said, it has been described in any possible bone. So they don't have any particular, you know, okay, uh, uh, only one particular uh, bone involvement or anything like that. So any, it has been described in almost all bones in the body. However, they're common in long bones more specifically in the proximal tibia and distal femur. They can also involve the flat bones, ribs, vertebrae, and so also tibular bones of the hands and feet. Uh, like uh, uh, Ishita already pointed out, they are common in the second to third decades and are more common in males. Uh, pathogenesis, they have been found to have upregulated expression of the glutamate receptor. Uh, coding region which is located on chromosome 6. Yeah, these are important. Gross. They will have well-defined margins. If you remember the radiology image that I showed you, well-defined, circumscribed. They are also multilobulated. And microscopy, I have shown you all the points there. So lobulated architecture with chondroid, mixoid, spindle cell, uh, which, were, which, are, which are actually myofibroblastic in nature. You will also find osteoclast giant cells. Mitosis, pleomorphism, so also necrosis is really not seen. IHC, definitely not required for the diagnosis, but it is chondroid origin, so it will be positive for S100. Uh, GRM1, the glutamate receptor 1 uh, coding region, this IHC is available, so that can be also be tried. So prognosis is excellent. Um, they say rec earlier considered as recurrences was very rare, but uh, recent reports suggest that almost 25% of the cases uh, can manifest as recurrences, and it's usually in the younger age group. What are the differential diagnoses to be considered here? Chondroblastoma. Uh, chondroblastoma, uh, of course, occurs in younger age group, but it is epiphyseal in origin, and the morphology is quite distinct. It will have those chicken wire calcifications and those grooving of the nuclei, etc. Chondrosarcoma, yes, you have to, in our case, you did not appreciate any pleomorphism, any mitosis, any uh, this thing. And there was no extension, no erosion of the uh, cortex or extension into the soft tissue. So you can rule that out. And another important thing is the chondromyxoid fibroma like osteosarcoma. Now, this, uh, this is the reference that I was talking about. So this, they have described 11 cases. And what is, they look, it looks very much like a chondromyxoid fibroma, but clinically it looks malignant. Radiologically, it looks malignant. And most importantly, you will be able to demonstrate the uh, malignant osteoid. So chondromyxoid fibroma like osteosarcoma is nothing but malignant osteoid in a background of, uh, of, of a chondromyxoid fibroma. So that's important. And uh, this is, uh, they say the GRM1, uh, immun GRM1 immunohistochemistry is in it will be positive only in a chondromyxoid fibroma. It will not be positive in any other chondrogenic tumor. So I think those uh, were the points that I would like to make. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next will be a few spotters by Dr. Bridge Mohan, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Um... Let me share my screen. Yes, okay. You, oh, so you can continue. Sir. There is a slight delay. Um, 
in the YouTube uh, streaming. So I'll keep the slide for a while. Come on guys, respond. Okay, I have started uh, getting the responses. One IHC for confirmation also, along with your diagnosis, please. Oh, okay, okay. All right, I have got enough and uh, I am very happy that most of the responses are correct with uh, the correct diagnosis and uh, and the IHC for confirmation. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll uh, go on to the next spotters. Please stop here. I will go on to the next spotters here. Right. not started getting responses for uh, this slide okay started now okay can you be a little more specific about the disease uh, which um, someone is referring in the live chat come on only two responses for this slide okay there are mixed responses okay All right, so at least you have identified that there is something, some infective uh, etiology which is going on and uh, most of the responses tells this is a fungal infections, that's correct. So what we call it is spaghetti and meatball appearance with short hyphae and pores, spores of... Uh, sir, tenia. your voice is not clear, sir. Your voice is not coming clear, sir. My voice is not clear? Now it is clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah now it's better, sir. Yeah, okay, okay. So this is uh, uh, what we know from a spaghetti and meatball appearance of uh, short hyphae and spores of uh, tinea versicolor. And many of the responses I got, correct petriasis versicolor, fungal infection, dermatophytosis, and all. All right. So I'll uh, show one more um, spotters here, and then I'll uh, stop uh, for the next case.
Is it okay, Sulekha, ma'am? Yes, sir. You can show one more case, sir. All right. Okay, this is the most easiest so there's one. There's a lot of background noise uh, at your end, sir. Is it? I switched off my fan. Okay. Now, is it uh, okay, ma'am? It's still coming, sir. There is some uh, noise while you're talking. Okay. I don't know where is this noise coming from. Okay. Uh, it's please all right, sir. It's all right, sir. Okay, please respond uh, for this uh, slide. Yes, started getting the responses. Excellent. Yeah, stop, stop. That's all. That's all. 100% correct. This is uh, the idea. Is no doubt about that. Thank you. I will hand over to Sulakha, ma'am. Take uh, over to you. Um, I'll present the rest of the cases after the presentation. Uh, so, the next presenter, thank you, sir. The next presenter will be Dr. Arushi Agarwal from JNMC, Belgaum. Uh, Ma'am, is my uh, voice audible? Yeah, you're audible and uh, we can uh, see your PPT also. We can start. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Arushya Garwal from JNMC Belgavi and I'll be presenting case number six. Ma'am, now I'm not able to access the PPT. We can see your PPT. You can just uh, continue presenting. Ma'am, it's not uh, moving in mind. Uh, okay. Uh, just a minute. I'll uh, try resharing it again. Otherwise, we'll go to the next presenter and we can come back to it. Yes, ma'am. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Arushi Agarwal from JNMC Belgavi, and I'll be presenting case number six. History provided was elderly female who has fe fever with chills and weight loss. On examination, there was bilateral uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, and uh, USG shows moderate splenomegaly. The PS showed iron deficiency anemia with pancytopenia, and LDH was 234 units per liter. Then uh, lymph node was biopsy. Section study shows a fragmented lymph node which has a fibrous capsule at various places with surrounding adipose tissue and blood vessels. The subcapsular sinus was obliterated. The uh, architecture of lymph node is effaced. The cortex medulla and follicles are not appreciated. The cells form ill-formed nodules, uh, vague nodules, as we can see here. These nodules shows sheets of cells which are mainly comprising of lymphocytes, which are small cells with scan cytoplasm and round nucleus. The neoplastic cells were appreciated, which are very large cells having abundant eosinophilic to pale cytoplasm. The nucleus of these cells are large with prominent nuclear membrane and dispersed chromatin. The nucleolus, uh, they have a nucleolus, very large nucleolus, almost equivalent to the size of a lymphocyte and with a perinucleolar halo. Few of these cells are binucleated or have multilobated uh, nucleus. These can be considered as RS or RS-like cells. Other than that, uh, we found a uh, lot of histiocytes, which are large cells with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm and a round to oval or indented nucleus with a prominent nucleoli. Immunoblasts are seen, which are large lymphocytes with a round uh, nucleus and have a single prominent nucleolus. Few plasma cells in the background were appreciated. There were areas, uh, pale areas, uh, eosinophilic homogeneous light areas around the nodules were appreciated, which could be considered sclerosis or fibrosis. Uh, then uh, various uh, foci show thickened blood vessels, uh, which were lined by plump endothelial cells. One foci was appreciated where the lesion was seen to be uh, extending outside the capsule. So we can say it as extra capsular extension. 
There were few mitotic figures. Uh, there was absence of neutrophils or eosinophils. No necrosis or no granulomas were found. So, on the basis of uh, history and the morphology, uh, if we consider Reed Stenberg cells, then Reed Stenberg cells are classically found in Hodgkin's lymphoma. Other than that, Reed Stenberg like cells are found in many uh, conditions, as I've listed. Uh, so, infectious mononucleosis usually occurs in young adults with history of pharyngitis, and uh, lymphocytosis is prominent, so we can rule out infectious mononucleosis. CMV lymphadenitis usually occurs in immunocompromised patients, which is not given in our history. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, it usually shows diffuse pattern and mostly occur in young men. So I would like to rule out that also. So uh, my differential diagnosis, I would like to give first differential as Hodgkin's classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Out of four variants, I would prefer lymphocytic rich variant as the lesion was full of lymphocyte. So I would uh, rule out lymphocyte depleted. Then uh, neutrophils and eosinophils were absent, so I would rule out mixed cellularity. And the nodules were vaguely formed, and most of the reed Stenberg cells were mononuclear variant with few classical. So I would like to rule out uh, nodular sclerosis also. Other than that, few popcorn-like looking cells were there, so I would like to put second differential as nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, then reed Stenberg like cells are present in peripheral T-cell lymphoma and angiomonoblastic lymphoma where multinucleated immunoblastic cells can be can, can look like reed sternberg cells. And uh, the history and morphology also uh, correlates with, with these two diagnoses. However, for a definitive diagnosis, uh, IHC panel is necessary. For, so for now, with the history and the morphology of the slide, I would like to give my report as lymph node biopsy features are suggestive of Hodgkin lymphoma and for advice, IHC for definitive diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arushi. The case will be discussed by Dr. Vidya. Uh, Arushi, if I say uh, CD30 was negative, do you want to... Uh... Uh, you're not audible, ma'am. Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. If I say CD30 is negative, uh, yes, do you want uh, Can to, you share uh... your PPT? Sorry, ma'am. Uh, PPT is not yet uh, shown, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I will share it. I'm sharing it. Uh, if I say CD30 was negative, um, do you want to uh, narrow down your diagnosis? You have given a wonderful uh, differentials and I'm very happy that you have reached uh, given all those DDs. But if I say CD30 was negative, do you want to change anything? Do you want to uh, narrow down your diagnosis? Ma'am, if CD, CD30 is negative, then it would go more towards uh, nodular uh, lymphocyte predominant uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, the non-classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, that's pretty good. Yes. So, uh, is my PPT visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, this was an elderly female uh, with history of weight loss, uh, cervical lymph nodes palpable, uh, peripheral smear showed uh, IDA and pancytopenia. There was moderate spinomegaly, or uh, LDH was elevated, and then a uh, lymph node was biopsied. Um, Arushi has done a good job, so she has covered most of it. I will just add on. So these were the fragmented bits of lymph node. So ideally, for a lymphoma diagnosis, you, you would want, any pathologist would want an intact lymph node, you know, so that you can appreciate all the, uh, the cortex, medulla, all the changes there. But remember, uh, you will be faced with uh, adverse situations. So this was what we got. It was all fragmented bits of lymph node. And uh, like Arushi has already pointed out, can you appreciate this some vague nodularity? Of course, there's some fibrosis here, some, but you can appreciate the vague nodularity. So I strongly recommend everybody to do reticulant stain or whenever you get a lymph node biopsy because the information or the um, that you get from a reticulant stain is you know incomparable. This is a reticulant stain. The same thing. You can appreciate the nice nodularity here, right? So the nodularity is enhanced by your reticulant stain. 
So I go, you go into higher power and you will see those, those nodules are comprised of these small lymphocytes. There are some histiocytes here and there. So there's some histiocyte. There are some dendritic cells. And then you come across this large cells. Now, these large cells are what are described as RS-like cells, okay? But they have this, multi, you know, multi-lobulated contour, the lobulated contour with multiple. It's not necessarily one nucleus. It can have one, two, three. So more than that also. So nucleolus. Look at the color of the nucleolus. The nucleolus is basophilic in appearance. So if it was an, a typical RS cell, the nucleolus is eosinophilic in appearance. So every fine detail you have to look into. So you know they are RS-like cells. It may be uh, the staining uh, defect also sometimes. Uh, but remember to look at the fine details. So you have this multi-lobulated contour of the nucleus and you have this small nucleoli which are basophilic and the background yes when you see a large cell in you know uh, uh, in a lymph node you first thing that uh, think you're, you 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 think about is is are they rs cells so let me search for the accompanying cells so rs cells usually are accompanied by eosinophils plasma cells so it's a, uh, a mixed population that is the, say, there in the background but in this in the entire in the entire slide, if you see, you will not find eosinophils or plasma cells. It is mainly these nodules which are comprised of these small lymphocytes, along with this histiocytes. Histiocytes are evident, and these scattered uh, RS-like cells. So this is once you get once you get eyes get used to it, you will start seeing them more in number. As you can see here, there are. I have put, I have highlighted them using this red arrow. So there's one here, 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 and I put a, a even a higher magnification. So just to just to show you that they are having a basophilic nucleolus. So like um, Dr. Arushi said, the same differential diagnosis we had. Classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, yes. But which are the classical Hodgkin lymphomas which show nodularity? You appreciated the nodularity when in you're doing your scanner view, okay, or the low power, view, uh, low power examination. So which are the lymphomas which can show nodularity? Hodgkin's, in Hodgkin's, it could be nodular sclerosis or it could be lymphocyte rich. Remember, lymphocyte rich Hodgkin's lymphoma is also having a nodular pattern. NLPHL, yes, nodular lymphocyte, the dominant Hodgkin's lymphoma, it could be or any NHL uh, uh, for that matter, but nodularity is usually seen in these. Then you have the T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. This and nodular lymphocyte predominant go hand in hand. One of them. are there in the uh, background so so point to remember it was the lymph node showed some nodules large irregular nodules and those nodules are t-cell rich nodules let us look at uh, the cd3 at a higher uh, magnification and you see something here what is it that you see there is this is the the large cell the large cells are cd3 negative is that all that you want to pick up from this image? No. You have to see that they are forming rosettes. The T cells, the CD3 positive T cells, are rosetting around these uh, large cells, what are called as T cell rosettes. So T cell rosettes are seen. Then we did a CD20. Always remember for lymphomas, always do CD3 and CD20 together. You get a complete picture. If you do only, even if you're thinking of a B-cell lymphoma, do not forget to do a T-cell marker. So it is incomplete if you do only one of them. So you're seeing this T-cell rosettes and these large cells are CD20 positive. The large cells are CD20 positive. This is nicely seen here. This is the large cell, which is CD20 positive, and all the cells around it are negative. So this would have actually been something like this. So this is the CD3, and this is the CD20. So you are seeing T cell rosettes. So what are the conditions? So when you're doing this, what are the conditions where you can get T cell rosettes? Classically in LLPHL, but you can get if it not in a de novo, but in a secondary 
T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma, you can get uh, T cell rosettes. So also in lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you even in a lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can get T cell rosettes. Yes, so Hodgkin's was definitely in our uh, differentials. So then we go, went ahead and did a CD30. CD30 is negative. Uh, CD15, uh, we uh, don't, do, do, uh, this does not work well. So we have not done a CD15. Um, but then I did an LCA. LCA is a very good marker. So you can also try a Pax5. Uh, Pax5 in Hodgkin cells will be pale positive or faint positive. Whereas in the other B cell origin tumors, it will be strong positive. So LCA, you can see this large cells are LCA positive. So again, that is a pointer against Hodgkin's lymphoma. So you have ruled out Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then we did two, uh, T two more T-cell markers, the CD4 and CD8. And as you can see here, it is CD4 uh, T-cells were more predominant in the background, whereas CD8 was less predominant. Then we need a CD21, which is highlighting this follicular dendritic cell uh, proliferation. So with all these findings, so presence of nodules, which are rich in T cells, which are showing those scattered, uh, there are T cell rosettes around these scattered large cells. The large cells are CD20 positive, but they are not. Was positive. So with this, we came to a final diagnosis of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Just that diagnosis is not enough. So we added this pattern D with T cell rich nodules. We will uh, learn about these uh, patterns in the next few slides. So this was the final diagnosis. Patient was stage four because he, he also had uh, it was an advanced disease because splenomegaly was there and the bone marrow uh, came positive. Patient received R-chop. Usually, if, it was, if it's a low-stage uh, nodular NLPHL, they are given Hodgkin's uh, disease, Hodgkin's lymphoma kind of chemotherapy. But the advanced stage and uh, uh, that variant histology usually receive R-chop uh, chemotherapy similar to that of uh, aggressive lymphomas. So patient uh, was, uh, she, she responded very well and she has been on follow-up for one year with no evidence of relapse. So let us learn a, a few more points about nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, do we call it as NLPHL or uh, with all the data that is coming in that suggests that it is not Hodgkin's and it is actually a B cell lymphoma. So this is the new term that you have to remember. It's a nod not as nodular lymphocyte predominant B cell lymphoma. But the WHO, uh, to you know, avoid confusions of all the ongoing clinical trials, has decided to retain this name for the time being. But I think eventually uh, the name will change to nodular lymphocyte predominant B cell lymphoma. So they are basically uh, indolent, is depending on the uh, stage and all this thing. Long-standing isolated lymphadenopathy is a common manifestation. Usually in fourth decade, most of them, or 75% of them are low stage and they respond very, they are usually have, have got a very good prognosis. Sometimes in around 20% of cases, they are advanced stage and liver and spleen can be involved. Mediastinum is involvement is rare, and so also bone marrow involvement is rare. But in our case, there was bone marrow involvement as also that was noted. Um, or almost 20% of the cases recur, and this is usually with when there is a variant histology at primary diagnosis, and almost 5% of cases will progress onto uh, DLBCL, which could be uh, conventional or NOS DLBCL or DLBCL that is a variant that is T-cell histocyte rich large B-cell lymphoma. So uh, why uh, are we presenting this case or why are we discussing this case is that there are a lot of changes that have come across. The name itself has changed when it is rare and it also has a risk of a, a progression. So progression to higher grade lymphomas. 
So cell of origin, it is considered to originate from this uh, germinal center B cell. Uh, so there is uh, what they have observed, they uh, uh, observed that it has more overlap with B cell lymphomas when compared to Hodgkin's lymphomas. Hodgkin's lymphoma will have a altered or disrupted B cell uh, 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 what is it, components. But uh, here in uh, not NLPHL, if you do a Pax5 or this thing, it is strongly positive, like seen in this case where the CD20 was nicely. Positive. Significant molecule of the T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma having this uh, alterations in uh, DASP2, SGK1, JANB, and also somatic. They also have somatic hypermutation of uh, immunoglobulin genes. Uh, morphology, typical morphology and variant morphology. Okay, typical is the nodularity, nodular growth, which shows dendritic cells, B cells, histocytes with scattered. Uh, lymphocyte predominant popcorn cells and the variant morphology. Now, it was Fan et al. who proposed that there are six patterns in uh, NLPHL, that is A to F, and uh, which we'll uh, see in the next few slides. Then, another important thing to remember here is eosinophils and plasma cells are rarely seen. Okay, eosinophils and plasma cells are rarely seen. Yeah, so this is the patterns that was first proposed by Fan et al. So you have the typical pattern, which has uh, A and B, pattern A and B. So this uh, gray area shows stands for B cell area, whereas the X stands for LP cell, and the white or the colorless area stands for the T cell area. As you can see here, pattern A shows nice B cell rich nodules, and within the nodules, you see the LP cells. Pattern B, similar to pattern A, that's why it's considered as typical, but pattern B shows the serpiginous. It is not that well-defined nodules. It shows serpiginous uh, aggregates of these B cell or, uh, or serpiginous B cell aggregates with this LP cells within those aggregates. Then you have the variant histology, starting with pattern C. Pattern C has more of T cells. So uh, as you come down to the uh, pattern variant histology or the pattern C to E, you will see that the, the B cell uh, area is shrunken and you have more of T cell rich areas. So pattern C has these nodules, but the no, uh, smaller nodules when compared to pattern A and most of the LP cells are present outside the extra nodular proliferation of the LP cells. Then you have pattern D, which shows T cell rich areas with these LP cells. Now, this was what we had observed in our case. We had this T-cell rich nodules with the popcorn cells. Then you have pattern E, which is considered uh, as uh, the um, T-cell histocyte rich large cell lymphoma like uh, NLPHL, where you will see that it is diffuse areas of T-cell rich uh, population with, with proliferation of the scattered uh, LP cells. And then even a single nodule, you should be able to demonstrate at least a single B cell rich nodule, which suggests that, okay, this is an NLPHL, which has now progressed or, you know, it is in the, uh, or it, uh, it is in an advanced or an, it has a variant histology with the, which looks similar to the uh, T cell histocyte rich large cell lymphoma. And then lastly is the pattern F, which has a morphetin appearance. Now, uh, C, D, E had a T cell rich background. Now again, pattern F has a B cell rich background and it has these uh, nodules of T cell rich areas plus these uh, overall appearing like a has a morthetan appearance. Now, why is this uh, variant histology? Why are you talking about all these patterns? It is important to document them because this variant histology has been associated with advanced disease and higher recurrence rates. Like in the current case, you saw that patient had bone marrow involvement, patient had splenomegaly, so it was an advanced stage. It was a stage four, in fact, so advanced disease and higher recurrence rate. So it is very, very important for you to document these patterns in your histopath report. And uh, when we talk about NLPHL, the, the, the typical cells that you see in there, the tumor cells, because all these are the backgrounds, the tumor environment, the micro environment okay the tumor cells are these lp cells or the lymphocyte predominant cells also called as the popcorn cells as you can see here they are they have a lobulated contour small nucleoli which are basophilic vesicular nucleus but these uh, look like that of a popcorn kernel that's why they are called as uh, 
popcorn cells. Okay, and uh, the immunophenotype also is very important. They can see the 20 positive, Pax5 positive, strong positive. They could be the, um, the the B cell transcription factors, which is that is OC2, BOB1 will be positive, B cell 6 will be positive. But the germinal center marker CD10 will be negative. CD10 will be negative. So also CD30, CD15, which actually helps to rule out that these are, uh, this is not a case of Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is, uh, or these are not RS cells. And uh, immunoglobulin D has also been found to, uh, to be expressed, not in all, but in a fragment of cases. LCA positivity also helps to rule out uh, RS cells. Coming on to the PD-1 rosettes, uh, we do not have this in here. So this image is taken from one of the lectures that I attended. So PD-1 rosettes is the same, um, similar to the T-cell rosettes. They are classically seen in uh, NLPHL, but they can also be seen in not the de novo uh, T cell histocyte rich class uh, large, cell, large B cell lymphoma, but the secondary, which arises as a result of progression of NLPHL. Okay, they can also be there. Remember, it's not just in NLPHL. You can also see them in lymphocyte rich classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, angiomyeloblastic uh, T cell lymphoma, and also peripheral T cell lymphomas, but not as striking as seen in NLPHL. PD one. Mm, can also be positive in many reactive conditions. PTGC, that is progressive transformation of germinal centers, is also a DD for uh, NLPHL. Okay, so in that also you can get it. So you have to not just see the PD1 positivity. Okay, then you start imagining the rosettes and call it NLPHL. You have to take the entire picture into consideration. Uh, Ayushi pointed out certain things. She said the obliteration of the subcapsular sinuses extension outside of the capsule external extension so those are they are also so they are also pointers to suggest that it is a lymphoma and it is not just a reactive condition so there are certain points like i would just like to uh, you know uh, tell highlight it again one is obliteration of uh, subcapsular sinus but there is one lymphoma where it is not there that is angiomyeloblastic t cell lymphoma you will not find so uh, the, the, the subcapsular sinuses will be patent. Then you have uh, extra nodal extension. That is, the, it is the, the infiltrate is extending beyond the uh, capsule. Then you do a retic stain so, to see for to see for the normal architecture. You can you can in a normal lymph node you will appreciate the cortex, the medulla, and uh, this thing with the in the normal reticular pattern. But in uh, a lymphoma, you will see that there is some alteration that has occurred. Okay. These are some of the pointers to suggest that you're dealing with a lymphoma and not just a reactive condition. Yes, a very important point with NLPHL is you have to remember that they can progress on to a higher grade lymphoma that is uh, uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or a variant of it that is the T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. Some uh, cases where NLPHL has followed DLBCL has also been described. So all morphology, what are the pointers? In NLPHL, it is nodular, it is B-cell rich. This I'm talking about the classic or the typical, in the, not the uh, variant morphology. In typical morphology, it, you have, that is the pattern A and B, you have the B-cell rich nodules. Then you have the uh, T-cell histocyte rich large B-cell lymphoma like NLPHL, where you get diffused with focal nodule. They say at least one nodule should be there for you to call it this entity. Okay. This is nothing but pattern E. And here you get a T cell rich background. Again, the T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma here, you will not find any nodularity. So if you do a CD, um, CD21, there will be no uh, staining at all. And here also it is a T cell rich background. Now, DLBCL, which arises from an LPHL, could be this or T, uh, T cell histocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. So, uh, what happens in, in a typical DLBCL that arises from NLPHL? Here you'll see that you see sheets of these large cells. They can retain their LP-like uh, morphology with that popcorn appearance, or they can look like immunoblast or centroblast. So, um, uh, so let's uh, to wind up. I would say that it's very important to remember this entity because its name itself can be most probably it will be changing, but we have to wait for the WHO to recommend it. Yes. Uh, thank you. I wind up my session. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next presenter will be Dr. Aparna.
from uh, SS Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Tadavangere. Uh, hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. You can start sharing your screen up right now. Yes, ma'am. Is it visible now? Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Aparna, uh, final year postgraduate from SSIMS RC Davangiri. Today I am going to present case number seven. A 62 years old female with the complaints of abdominal distension and significant weight loss. On ultrasound, there was a complex solid cystic mass in the pelvis was seen. Serum CA 125 level was 49 units per milliliter and uh, serum CEA level was 0. Uh, nanogram per deciliter and it was in right ovarian mass. Similar two sections were given for the diagnosis. They showed cystic area and a predominant solid area. First, we are going to see the cystic area. There were varying size of cyst showing uh, secretions and also the clear spaces. The cysts were lined by uh, stratified columnar secreting cells and at places they were multi-layered. Mixture of patterns were seen Few areas were showing the papillary pattern and few showing the glandular pattern. The solid predominant area, the tumor cells were arranged in lobules divided by the delicate fibrous septa. These are the delicate fibrous septa dividing into the lobules. The individual tumor cells showed the clear cytoplasm, abundant clear cytoplasm with a vesicular nucleus and prominent nucleoli. Uh, there were uh, highly nice stromal cell, stroma amongst the uh, tumor cells. A frequent finding of this tumor was amorphous eosinophilic hyaline globules, which were scattered among the tumor cells. And these are the hyaline globules. There were ring-like tubules lined by the cuboidal cells with a clear cytoplasm filled with eosinophilic secretions. And this hyaline uh, material gave the appearance of a basement membrane-like. Few focal areas showed mucin. And these are the hyalinized stroma amo amongst the uh, tumor cells. To summarize, an elderly female with a right ovarian mass showed cystic solid areas composed of cells with abundant clear cytoplasm, vesicular nucleus with prominent nucleoli, hyaline globules and mucinous area. We have given three differential diagnoses. One is clear cell carcinoma of ovary. Next is metastatic renal cell carcinoma, clear cell variant, and yolk sac tumor, microcystic variant. To say it is a clear cell carcinoma of ovary, we have clear cytoplasm. There was a monotonous tumor cell population, uh, eosinophilic hyaline globules, stromal hyalinization, and presence of complex papillary structure that contain hyaline core. And on IHC, if done, it shows keratin, EMA, CD15, BEREP, viamentin, PAX8 positivity. The second uh, differential diagnosis was metastatic renal carcinoma, which is usually bilateral involvement. But here we see the unilateral involvement. And on IHC, keratin 34 beta E12 will be negative and CD10 will be positive, and the opposite is true for the clear cell carcinoma ovary. And in yolk sac tumor, uh, you occasionally uh, it is presented in a younger uh, group of individuals, but here the case we see an elderly female, and there was an absence of Schiller dual body, and there were no prominent reticular pattern. On IHC, it will show SAL4 positivity. With all these above features, uh, we come to a final diagnosis of clear cell carcinoma of ovary. Thank you, Dr. Aparna. Uh, the case will be discussed by Dr. Vishwatriya, sir. Uh,
So this was the case which was uh, given to us. Uh, so it was an elderly lady with uh, normal tumor marker levels and a right pelvic lymph node, as has been rightly described by a colleague here. So we see that this is, uh, we see two components here. We see that there is a prominent fibrous stroma here and it is lined by cells with prominent clear cytoplasm. So we see that and there is some secretions there. So we have a fibromatous stroma and we have cells, we have a tubulopapillary and more cystic areas which are lined by a single layer of uh, cells with a clear cytoplasm. Some tubular areas here and amidst fibromatous stroma and some prominent clear cells, clear cells. We see that there is something called as a hobnailing or the antipodal arrangement of the tumor cells also, which we can see here. Antipodal arrangement means the, the orientation of the nuclei is away of the is away from the basement membrane, or it is more towards the apex of the of the more towards the luminal side of the of the cells. So we can see here we have it has a prominent clear cell uh, component. Uh, within a fibromatous stroma. So the first, a common example question is what are the causes of clear cells? We could just type in the in the chat box there. So the common causes are hydropic change when there is water. It could be fat, it could be lipid, it could be mucin, it could be an artifact, or it could be a dilated vesicle. So these are the different causes of clear cell. You could read this article in from IJPM in the pathology micro. Biology with clear cell lesions in pathology. You could read about an approach to diagnosis because we have clear cell lesions in the ovary, we have clear cell tumors in the kidney, we have clear cell tumors in the GI tract. So clear cells are ubiquitous. So we need to uh, know the approach to tumors with the clear cell morphology. You could refer to this article by uh, Dr. Asanatikar from Kat Katak. So you can see that I, I have highlighted some highline globules as has been highlighted by my colleague here the yellow stars represent the highline globules the clear cell and clear cell carcinomas is because of the presence of glycogen they are fast positive diastase sensitive that that gives them the clear uh, morphology here we can see that i am seeing cells with a more eosinophilic cytoplasm in the same uh, same case so need not all clear cell carcinomas have a predominant clear cell, but there will always be some areas which will show up for a clear cell morphology, but you can have eosinophilic variant. This is the, in the same case where we had cells which were completely eosinophilic. Uh, so we you know, this, this um, and also one thing I would like to reiterate, we don't get normally uh, uh, much mitotic activity like, like we get in high grade serous carcinomas, like the criteria there is more than 12 per 10 high power field. We don't get so much of a mitotic activity here. We do sometimes get a prominent nucleoli, but not as prominent cherry red like in a high grade serous carcinoma. Uh, the, the necrosis is also not very prominent here like we get in high grade serous carcinomas. Coming down to the immunohistochemistry, so PAX8. PAX8 is, is a Mullerian marker. So a common question would be what are the other tumors which can be PAX8 positive? As has been rightly pointed out, kidney tumors, renal tumors can be PAX8 positive. So, so uh, tumors arising from the thyroid, tumors arising from the thymus, tumors of the Mullerian origin, Wolfian duct origin. Mullerian origin includes uh, from the ovaries, from the from the fallopian tube, from the endometrium or the endocervix. They can all be uh, Paxate positive. Paxate is, is a nuclear, is a transcription factor, so it's a nuclear marker here. To consider something as Paxate positive, it should show strong diffuse nuclear staining to be considered as Paxate positive. So any tumors of thymic, thyroid, Mullerian, Wolfian, and renal origin can be Paxate positive. So similarly, metastasis from a clear cell RCC of the kidney cannot be ruled out by just a Paxate positivity. Next is WT1. So, so WT1 is stands for Wilms tumor 1. WT1 is commonly uh, seen expressed in high grades or serous tumors of the ovary, both low grade, high grade, and benign. So what is the internal control here? Internal control is that it's, it highlights all the endothelial cells. So what are the other tumors which are which can be WT1 positive? Other tumors include, it can be most commonly it's mesothelial, any mesothelioma, adenomatoid tumors, uh, sex cord stromal tumors, tumors of endothelial differentiation. They can all be even uh, serous tumors, serous, benign serous, borderline and high grade serous. They will be positive for WT1. So we should know what is the internal control and what are the other tumors which are positive for WT1. But this case was negative for WT1, ruling out a serous carcinoma. 
Napsine. Napsine, we all know, is a, is a typical marker for pulmonary origin. But Napsine is a beautiful marker which 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 can be used to diagnose a clear cell a clear cell a, a carcinoma of the of the of the ovary. We can see that mostly tends to be patchy. You can have areas which are strongly there, which are which are which some areas which are showing a patchy uh, patchy expression. So Napsine is a good marker. Again, we can see here that there is a kind of a patchy expression of napsine, but it's definitely positive. Napsine is a cytoplasmic stain. Amakar, 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 what is amakar? We typically associate amakar with uh, prostate cancers. Amakar stands for alpha methyl, uh, alpha methyl uh, uh, coenzyme resimase, which is typically expressed by the prostate uh, cells of the pro prostatic origin. But we know that MRCAR can be expressed by clear cell carcinomas of the ovary, can be expressed by papillary uh, RCC of the kidney. It is expressed by uh, hepatocellular carcinomas. It can be expressed by a subset of colorectal and gastric carcinomas. Also, MRCAR is not typically restricted. MRCAR expression is not typically restricted to tumors of, of, of prostatic origin. This tumor here, all clear cell uh, uh, carcinomas of the ovary are known to express MRCAR along with Napsin A. So Napsin A and MRCAR positivity along with positivity for Paxit and negativity for WT1 helps us to come to a diagnosis. MRCAR again we see it can have a patchy expression sometimes but it's a cytoplasmic stain because it's an enzyme. Then the next IHC which we did was a P53. P53 is important because we need to document the mutants type uh, staining here or P53 mutation. Clear cell carcinomas normally in 20 to 30 percent of the cases will harbor a P53 mutation. So what is the def definition? We, so we I have seen many residents write P53 negative or positive. P53 is never positive or negative. Either you have a wild type staining or a mutant type staining. The new WHO in its fifth edition has revised its definition for uh, P53 mutant type staining, where uh, it can be a null phenotype because of a nonsense mutation in the P53 gene, where, the, where there's expression in less than 5% or none of the tumor cell. P53 is a nuclear stain. Then if it is if it is being expressed in none of the tumor cells or in less than 5% of the tumor cells, it is considered a null type and it is also a mutant type staining. Then you can have a, a, a strong diffuse nuclear staining, a strong diffuse nuclear staining in more than 80% of the tumor cell again makes it a mutant type staining or that is because of a missense mutation or you can have a cytoplasmic strong diffuse cytoplasmic staining that also is now qualifies as a mutant type staining. So P53 mutations are immunohistochemistry interpretation of P53 protein is never a positive or a negative either it's a wild type or a mutant type of expression. So in this case, it was a wild type of expression because we expect P50, although uh, serious uh, clear cell carcinoma of the ovaries are considered high grade, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is not, does it, it shows P53 mutation in only 20 to 30 percent of the cases. They are typically associated with endometriosis. They carry as bad a prognosis as high grade serious carcinomas of the ovary and are considered similar and are treated along the same lines. So we could re refer to this article, Clear Cell Carcinoma Epidemiology, Pathological and Biological Features by Guguchi. You could read this. This is then you could refer to this article, which, which, which clearly and very succinctly uh, summarizes all the pathological, the molecular, and the treatment options, including the clinical outcomes of patients with clear cell carcinoma of the ovary. And as we are pathologists, I would really, I would ask you to recommend read up this immunostrum, this, uh, this uh, based on the fifth edition of the WHO uh, classification of tumors of the female genital tract. We have this article by Dr. Natalie Busa, where she has nicely discussed the immuno immunohistochemistry approach to different gynecological tumors. Uh, this is this is both are freely available on the on the on on the, on, uh, on Google. Or you could just Google that, or you could just download it from SciHub. It's available there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. The next presenter, uh, the last presenter for the day is Dr. Nabila Azar from Mahadevapa Medical College, Kalwurdi. My audio clear. Yeah, you're audible, Dr. Nabila. Okay. A very good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Nabila Azhar from Can Mahadev. Can you share your screen, please? Ma'am, is your it screen has it? It's not yet visible. Can you see it, ma'am? Not yet. Okay. 
Yes, it's visible now. It will start. Okay. A very good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Nabil Azhar from Mahadevapur Rampuri Medical College. The case allotted to us was TS female, complaints of menometrorrhagia, endometrial polyps was given. Uh, this is a scanner view showing polypoidal lining epithelium with a uh, few hypercellular areas and fibromatous stroma can be seen along with areas of hemorrhage and congestion. This is another magnification view wherein we can see the endometrial glands shows complex architectural variability and they are arranged back to back and they are surrounded by fibromatous stroma along with areas of congestion and hemorrhage. These glands columnar epithelium with pseudostratification and these glands are surrounded by intersecting bundles of smooth muscle cells. This is a magnification of the previous image wherein we can see the glands are arranged back to back. They are lined by cuboidal to columnar epithelium with pseudostratification is seen which is surrounded by smooth muscle stroma and also in the stroma we can see dense inflammatory infiltrates. This is another uh, magnification view wherein we can see the irregular or typical glands which are haphazardly distributed in the smooth muscle stroma. In the magnification, we can see the cribriform architecture of the glands are noted and the stroma shows dense inflammatory infiltrate which are composed of neutrophils, lymphocytes and plasma cells along with areas of hemorrhage can be noted. This is another magnification view wherein we can see the stratification of the glands and there is an intact basement membrane and there is no loss of polarity. Also, we can see the stroma shows dense lymphocytic infiltrate. In this magnification, we can see uh, there are presence of squamous modules. Also, mild cytologic RTPA can be seen along with areas of hemorrhage. In a uh, we could see a papillary projections along with dense inflammatory infiltrate and areas of hemorrhage. The stroma also showed the presence of foamy macrophages and cholesterol clefts. So the diagnosis we came to was a typical polypoid adenomyoma with low malignant potential. It is an uncommon lesion commonly seen in pre-perimenopausal age group, presence with abnormal uterine bleeding and it is solitary, well-circumscribed polypoidal lesion. Microscopically, it is a biphasic tumor with complex architecture and at places shows cytologic atypia. The glandular component often shows disorganized endometroid hyperplastic glands with lobular architecture and cribriforming of the glands along with stratification. Also, it, uh, this uh, diagnosis shows prominent squamous modules and the surrounding fibromuscular stroma is prominent. Stroma also shows foamy macrophages, cholesterol clefts and inflammation. The other differential diagnosis we made was endometroid type adenomyoma. In endometrioid type adenomyoma, there is lack of uh, glandular pattern and usually the squamous modules are absent. And the third differential we could come was myoinvasive endometrioid adenocarcinoma. As the malignant features are not seen in our case, the myoinvasive endometrioid adenocarcinoma was ruled out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nabila. The case will be discussed by Dr. Vishwapriya, sir. Sir, over to you. Yeah, Dr. Nabila has been spot on. This is a case of a typical polypoid adenomyoma. We, go, we first do, do any approach to tumors is that we start with scanner view. We try to look at the architecture. We see that this is a polypoidal lesion. It's a three-dimensional structure. So it's polypoidal. It's surrounded by endometrial glands on three sides. So what this is a this is one slide from Morphal, which I, which which is highlighting all the three components as has been described by Dr. Nabila here. The red star here highlights the the atypical endometrioid the crowding the crowded there is a lobular uh, the arrangement of these atypical endometrioid glands then which which are showing the blue arrow highlights these squamous modules within those glands and the yellow uh, star here asterisk here highlights the fibromatous fibromyomatous stroma so this is a, this is a biphasic tumor uh, composed of of atypical endometrioid glands and and a prominent fibromatous stroma here you can see there is areas of cholesterol cleft and necrosis which is there. 
we can see some areas of necrosis here we can see some squamous nodules here the most prominent thing is the back to back complex uh, uh, the crowding of endometroid glands here again the same biphasic pattern has been highlighted here it's the it's the fibromyomatous component and the uh, typical endometroid component here glandular component in a typical lobular architecture we can see some eosinophilic secretions here within those glands and the glands tend to be atypical more 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 crowded uh, with, with with some with some amount of uh, uh, loss of uh, uh, but no typical loss of polarity or mitotic activity here has been noted this is the squamous nodules which has been uh, which has, which is multifocal here and is one of the diagnostic features defining features of atypical polypoid adenomyoma same here again some we can have or sometimes we can have it may not be fibromyomatous it can be more fibrous sometimes so what are our typical polypoid adenomyoma they are they come under the category of mixed epithelial mesenchymal tumors of the uterine corpus in the who fifth edition of the who which includes adenomyoma or typical polypoid adenomyoma and adenosarcoma they are rare the mean age is 39 years and typically involve the lower uterine segment then typically present as a single polypoid lesion Microscopy has been well described by Dr. Nabila here. It shows a lobular proliferation of irregular, architecturally complex, mild to moderately dysplastic endometroid glands. There is glandular crowding and squamous modular metaplasia is always present. One of the defining features here. Necrosis almost always present. You will you you uh, as squamous modular metaplasia is the defining feature. Focal necrosis is almost always seen. Fibromy fibromyomatous to myomatous stroma is seen. What is what is what is of concern here is the risk of recurrence, which is about 30%, and risk of progression to malignancy, which is around 8 10%. So these tumors are not are not endometroid endometrial polyps. They typically are sent as endometrial polyps, and 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 they they tend to have a, a higher chance of recurrence and higher chance of progression to malignancy. They normally do not harbor um, and uh, carcinomas, but they tend to progress to carcinomas. But endometrial polyps tend to harbor rarely endometrial cancers, endometroid carcinomas within them. These tend to progress in in around 10% of the cases. So just to summarize, the 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 they are biphasic tumors with atypical crowded endometrial glands. The stroma with squamous modular metaplasia, which is the defining feature, and you have fibromyomatous to myomatous stroma. So this and this is and the it is it's it's a rare entity with a risk of recurrence of around 30 percent and risk of progression to malignancy in around 8 percent of the cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for ending the session, we have a few more spotters by Dr. Bridge. So uh, you can take over for a thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, so I have uh, towards the end last two spotters. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. So. Can I get some responses over here? It's a lung lesion. Okay. Okay. Carcinoid, adenoid cystic. So we are revolving around the carcinoid and adenoid cystic carcinoma.
yeah excellent um, i'm seeing here uh, almost 100% of uh, the students have responded well and correct this is a case of uh, adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma most commonly it is uh, central in location the clue was in this case So the last uh, spotters uh, for the day. Can I have some differential or diagnosis? You can give diagnosis or differential diagnosis as well. Okay. Papilloma. All right. Okay, we are hovering around uh, encapsulated intracystic papilloma, papillary or uh, papilloma, intraductal papilloma, intracystic papillary carcinoma, intraductal papilloma. So there is a mixed response in this case. Uh, many uh, so, uh, many of uh, PGs are thinking that this is a intraductal papilloma, which is a benign lesion. And some are thinking it is an encapsulated papillary carcinoma or intraductal papillary lesion. So what next? Okay. Can you um, narrow down your diagnosis now? Okay. Nitya Prem has uh, given a good differential diagnosis here. Out of all the differential diagnosis, can we narrow down to something more precise and more specific? P63 is present all over the places. CK56 is uh, retained, preserved. Okay, it's a benign lesion. So what is the lesion? We got the differential diagnosis as intraductal papilloma or it's an encapsulated papillary carcinoma. Could be a papillary DCIS. So what will be the narrow down diagnosis here? Okay, papilloma, micropapillary carcinoma, all right. Why can't be just an intraductal papilloma? Because myopithelial cells are present throughout and it was also present at the periphery. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Aditya. That's all from my side. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we would like to end the session today uh, by thanking all the participants, all the PGs, and all the viewers uh, who have been throughout with us for the day. Thank you, uh, KMC, for the wonderful cases. Uh, we, I'm, I hope and I'm sure that uh, all of us have learned a lot, especially the PGs. Uh, I would also like to remind that uh, the 
CAPCON 2023 will be organized by uh, Padamulla Medical College, Mangalore, and the registrations will be opening from next week. So, uh, and uh, please subscribe if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, stay tuned. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.